what is mindfulness? How can we apply it to make our day-to-day lives happier and easier? Why is it important for our children? And how can we integrate it easily into our lives? I am Ree from mummyof4.com and today I'm joined for a chat by Amy Polly, mindfulness rebel and mental health advocate. Amy has some really important insights to share about how we can take care of our own mental health, some super easy steps that we can slot into even the busiest of days and how we can set an excellent example for our children. Now I'm really sorry to say that while recording this, I made a slight audio error. I've got my fancy microphone set up, I've got all this fancy software, but when I was bringing on an interview guest, it's the first time I've done this, I clicked the wrong button and all the audio ended up coming out of my laptop, not my fancy microphone. So I'm human, I'm sorry, I'll do better next time. I hope you can ignore that my audio is not quite as crispy as I was hoping that it would be. But that being said, I really hope you enjoy this interview. Amy had some amazing insights during our chat, some takeaways that I am really going to be implementing into my life. So without further ado, here's Amy Polly. Amy, hello. Thank you for joining us today. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Well, no, it's fantastic. It's an absolute joy. Thank you for being my very first guest on my video and podcast, Real Talk with Ree. Mindfulness. We should all know what this is, but I feel like most people just don't. So what would you say people's idea of mindfulness is compared to the reality of what you know it to be? So... This is like my life's work, by the way, is to help bust these misconceptions because I believe in it so much. Um, I think that people still think that mindfulness is really woo woo and Mm. it's just about meditation and they need to be somewhere very calm and they need to be calm and everything needs to be still and maybe there's some rainbows and some unicorns and uh, you know it's it's all about relaxation and sort of sitting cross-legged and it is so far from that it's unbelievable it's so much more than just meditation meditation is a part of mindfulness but mindfulness isn't just meditation and I guess the way that I always explain it is mindfulness just means awareness and we are all aware all of the time. The problem is that our awareness goes into places that are unhelpful, like the past or the future, Mm. uh, or our awareness is taken by things like technology um, and going down social media holes. And it's, you know, distraction is a big thing in our modern world for our cave person brain. Um, And so really it's a brain training to train yourself to put your awareness where you want it to be, basically. That's how I explain it. so and less if you're all aware all of the time. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So less having our fingers pressed together and our legs crossed and saying om um. <laughs> with something we don't have to go to a yoga studio <laughs> to do. More just choosing what we're keeping in mind then, rather than Yeah, you can allowing... practice mindfulness anytime. Fantastic. What brought you to this space? What made this your life work? How how did you end up here? <laughs> <laughs> how long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> Um, So basically, in terms of mindfulness, I found mindfulness when I was going through a period of stress. Um, Now, bearing in mind, this is, I always say 10 years ago, but I've been saying that for a little while, so it must be starting to get more than 10 years. Quite often, that's what we do. We turn to things once we get to a point of crisis or nearing crisis and and that is what I did so I was going through a period of stress wasn't in a good relationship at the time Uh, my work was quite stressful and I wasn't sleeping very well and as we do we go on some search engine in the middle of the night and I found the words mindfulness and meditation and so I looked into it started to practice uh, went on YouTube did a couple of meditations and just immediately I noticed the way that I did feel relaxed I noticed that I was falling asleep a little bit easier and then a week of practicing that um, I was sleeping you know more soundly and it was just that light bulb moment of there's something in this I need to know everything Uh, and that's what I did so I went and signed up got some books off Amazon Amazon, signed up to a diploma in mindfulness and meditation as you do Um, and yeah just learned about it and 
over this journey, I've learned more and more that it isn't always inclusive and accessible. It's so much more than meditation. But but that's where it all started for me, helping me to sleep better. And then as it's progressed over the years, it's helped me with so many things. Going through miscarriage, losing my grandparents, um, having my little boy, just like the day to day day stresses of the world I, like, I don't know what I would do without my mindfulness practice um and I was an accountant for nearly 20 years oh, so wow. this is a huge change for me to now be running my own business but people have always been my fit like I just love people and I love helping people um and when I was given the opportunity within my last role to to work with people more than spreadsheets I was like ah this is my thing ah. <laughs> this is what I want to do this is your jam this is your groove really when you put it like that it sounds so simple yet so many of us just don't do it that's the, the fact of the matter I think a lot of people but correct me if I'm wrong just don't know what it is don't know what to do and it seems like a very complicated sort of out of reach thing that other people can do <laughs> so what would you say would be a really good starting point for someone that's looking to explore mindfulness but just doesn't know where to begin. What would be those first steps you could suggest they might take? Yeah, and and you are right. I I do think that people think it's complicated and it's like another thing to add to the to-do list, but it absolutely isn't. You, like I said, you are aware all of the time. It's not something new to do. It's a different way of doing things. So what I would say is, as I said before, meditation is a part of mindfulness. And I know people hear the word meditation and think, but it, it doesn't have to be, it's, it's not necessarily spiritual. It doesn't have to be lengthy. It doesn't even have to be in silence. Um, you know, for someone like me who has ADHD, uh, that is not the most easy thing in the world. And I always say, if I can do it, anybody can do it. So the starting point for me with mindfulness is this, start to notice all of the things that you do on autopilot. And bearing in mind, my business started teaching mums. That is where this all started because, you know, I struggled and I wanted to share what I'd learned. And we do so many things on autopilot. You think about your typical day where you wake up in the morning and you pull the covers over the bed, you go and brush your teeth, you are popping the kettle on, you're, you're rushing around maybe to get the kids ready. All of that, you're not really paying attention to anything that you're doing. Your mind is on the next thing you need to do, getting them out the door, what you're going to be doing later, the thing that you messed up yesterday. We're not present with what we are doing. And unfortunately, that then impacts on us not being present with maybe our partner, our friends, our children, our colleagues, because um, quite often we're on autopilot when we're speaking to them, like how many ch times has your kid said to you, look at this rock, and you're like, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm trying to do X, Y, and Z, you know, but to them, that's really important thing. So if we can start to be a bit more mindful in those mundane everyday moments, our brain starts to train itself to be able to choose to do that when we want to do it, which might be when you're interacting with your kids. So start noticing your autopilot, you go away from this podcast, start noticing and you're thinking, oh my goodness, there's so many things that I do without thinking about it. Um, and then just choose one or two things that you do every day anyway, to be more present with. That is mindfulness. So use as many of your senses as possible. And it can be like when you're making the bed, smelling the sheets, good or bad, you know, might have teenagers, uh, but smelling the sheets, uh, you know, really listening to the sounds of the movement, really noticing like the movement in your muscles and your joints. Uh, you might even notice sounds outside. You might be able to notice things that you can uh, taste. Maybe you've just had a coffee or whatever it is. So really using those senses. One of my favorite things is brushing your teeth because you're using all of your senses. You can see yourself, you can smell, you can taste. These little things seem so almost ridiculous like how is that going to help me but that is the starting point retraining your ability to pay attention and that is where it all starts does that make sense yeah absolutely so it's actually um it's like the grounding exercises that I do with my children isn't it so when they're stressed out and you're asking them for something they can see something they can yep. smell something. but but just rather than being like okay I'm in a point of crisis I need to do this now in order to calm down just kind of doing it a bit more exactly day proactive yeah before before we reach that point where we're like Ooh. um yes. so I think um I mean you you touched on the um uh, diagnosis of ADHD I think this is something that a lot of women and girls especially they're not diagnosed enough would you say that's that's right yeah, absolutely and I think a lot of us have kind of tangled mum brain <laughs> And, you know, a lot going on and a lot to juggle. At what stage was it the mindfulness that kind of made you realise that there may have been ADHD at play or did that come? No. 
what was your kind of story? No, absolutely not. It was actually having my baby was the catalyst for my diagnosis. Um, yeah, when I, when I was on uh, BBC, did an awareness piece, which was really nice. They contacted me to talk about it because I don't think it's talked about very much, the link between hormones um, and how that can really affect your ADHD symptoms. So throughout my life, we have to remember that you, the way that you are um, brought up, be that the education system that you're in, the type of school that you're in, the teachers you have, your family, your friends, that environment can, environment can really impact how it presents for you. And, you know, I feel very fortunate that I had a very close family. Um, my mum, I always say, look, I don't know what I would do, would do without my mum. She's been very supportive. At the time, I probably thought my school was crap, but in hindsight, my school was all right, you know. Um, and so I think that throughout life, I managed my symptoms because number one, I didn't know I was different to anybody else. I thought everybody else was struggling the way that I was struggling. Like, you know, I didn't know I was any, I was any different. And also, you know, we know that uh, females mask easier. We often don't have so much hyperactivity. Um, and so it doesn't always get spotted. Like my grades were okay. When you're not a problem to other people, when things are externally an issue, it's less likely to be noticed. And so I just cracked on, like I got support when I needed it and I was okay. And I think that sort of happens throughout my life. And even in work, you know, when I look back and see the struggles that I had in my accountancy career, um, some of the things that I did last minute, the way that I studied and passed my exams and stuff like that, um, obviously I didn't know any different, but uh, I just got on with it because I only really had me to look after. When I had my baby, it was a whole different ball game. And I think in that situation, the hormones had an effect. I think the fact that you've got somebody else to look after had a real big impact because it's not just you anymore that you've got to look after there's there's somebody else to look after and even my mum said she was shocked at how I didn't manage considering I've always wanted a baby and I was so excited and blah blah, blah. and it manifested as postnatal anxiety and I really really struggled and um, it was in conversation with my GP because I just knew that I was not okay and I could not articulate exactly why that was but it was that sort of inner knowing that something's not right here my, my thoughts were racing much more my mindfulness practice felt very difficult um and so yeah having my baby was the catalyst because I just knew that something wasn't wasn't right um and I guess I just couldn't mask any anymore so yeah that's where it all came from oh, when I was 37. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow so I guess you were quite lucky in a way that you'd already established a lot of these mindfulness things that were sort of mm. strategies to accidentally help with yeah. what you didn't realise was a problem. Yeah, and I guess the thing is, you know, and I've said this all along that, uh, you know, even before I knew that I had ADHD, I knew I had a busy mind. I knew that I was not inherently a calm person, um, but I could still practice mindfulness because mindfulness isn't just about being able to sit still. It, in fact, you don't have to sit still to practice mindfulness. Uh, a lot of time people don't realise that when they're going to the gym or they're going on a walk or a run, that actually that is a very mindful practice. Um, you don't have to be sitting still in silence for 20 minutes. So I just found what worked for me. And I guess that's why I love teaching so much because I know that I'm a little bit different. Like when I go into schools in my Disney track suit and I'm, I'm sort of, Hi everyone! You know, they did probably <laughs> expect I know you, you'd love it. Yeah, you need that tracksuit. Mm -hmm. Um you know, you'd expect uh, maybe a mindfulness teacher to come in and be and be very calm. And I I'm just not I'm just not like that. Um and I think I hope that that makes it um a little bit easier for people to learn. It makes it um you know a bit more human centric and a a bit more accessible for people that's what I want it to be inclusive and so I just found my own way I guess I'm a little bit stubborn in a way and I did hyper focus on learning all about mindfulness so um I just found my way and it's really worked so I want to help other people to find their way it doesn't have to be my way but to find their way does that, that make fantastic yeah fantastic. <laughs> from the the ADHD point of view if there's anyone listening that thinks oh I wonder if if that's that's me. What would you say were some kind of traits that perhaps you didn't realise were connected, but were kind of with now you can say, oh, well, that, that's ADHD. And then perhaps someone listening might think, well, maybe it's worth me exploring this further. What would you, which kind of... Yeah, um, so obviously I am not in any way a psychiatrist, so I would not be able to, you know, no, diagnose no, just anyone. just your personal um, experience. Yeah, your... uh, so I would always say for people to go and, and definitely have that talk, and I know not all GPs are as good as mine, I was very, very lucky, so, but 
but be persistent if you need help whatever it is not not just the ADHD mental health whatever it is if you need help unfortunately in this world we have to be persistent and that can sometimes feel difficult you know why should I have to fight for help but unfortunately this is where we're at um you know systems aren't always working so just make sure that if you do feel like you need help you know you, you keep going so um I think some of the traits for me that I've come to realize and by the way it took me well over a year of processing before I started to talk about it uh, oh, wow. really openly because and I guess that is part of my mindfulness practice that self-awareness and being able to process things and look after myself but I really realized that my emotional dysregulation has really impacted my relationships so uh, having quite big emotions where people would think that that is ridiculous um you know I, I struggle to articulate myself if I am emotional um so my partner now bless his heart really is starting to understand that so he knows that if it's an emotional situation we can actually take a pause and then I'll be able to talk about it at another time or later or whatever because uh, I really find that difficult and sometimes my emotions will come out for example if I'm feeling anxious or upset it actually comes out as anger and I'm not angry he's been, he's been so good recently at exploring that so um that was a really big realization for me because I know that I'm very self-aware but some of those things you just can't control so you have to be able to, to create the gap which is one of the parts of mindfulness is create that gap to then respond rather than react, which is so useful when you've got ADHD. Other things like, um, you know, just being very sensitive to rejection, that really cuts deep. And, and my empathy really helps me with my job. But my mum even said to me the other day when we were watching some hospital programme, oh, you've got too much empathy. And I said, but that is really good for my job. But things cut me deep, you know, mm. even when I'm watching a programme about someone getting hurt you know, funny videos where someone's hurting themselves I just like I don't I don't particularly like that I can't watch things where people are hurt and stuff like that so things like that that you think especially like the emotional thing and also working um you know till the last minute the time blindness is has always been an issue but if nobody knows about it and I still got my stuff done as I said it wasn't a problem to anybody else to me it was an absolute nightmare but nobody else knew about it because I still met my deadlines um so these things can be really debilitating in your life and like I said it depends what support you've got and things like I mean you do not want to look at my house right now it's an absolute mess. and everybody's untidy but I mean it like it's it impacts life is you know what I'm what I'm trying to say so yeah so there's some of the things I guess that that I struggled with throughout my life and and now I realise that that's what it is and I've started to be able to help myself. So, yeah, it's been really eye opening, even though it posed a lot of questions. It, ha it had a lot of unpacking <laughs> to do. Yeah. Oh, that's really, really interesting because not all of those things people would necessarily think of as related. And I know one thing that um, I get asked a lot about, you know, my children have autism diagnosis. The diagnoses, plural of diagnosis. I wanted to get them diagnosed so I could access help from school. But I feel like when you're out in the world as an adult, it's getting a diagnosis, it's like it has a different reasoning behind it because obviously you're not applying for help or extra time in the exam or something. So, what difference has it made for you in the world having a diagnosis, or is it more just the understanding of your mind that's that's helped I think it's a bit of both actually and I think it's like with anything uh you know it, it doesn't have to be diagnosed it's just anything that comes back to self-awareness and understanding yourself because by knowing yourself by knowing how you work by knowing the things that you struggle with means that number one you can help yourself like that literally has to be number one it isn't anybody else's responsibility even though we do want the world and organizations and schools and everybody else and the government to do what they are supposed to do number one is you so understanding yourself is so powerful because then you can make sure that you're putting things in place to help yourself um like i always say when we talk about whether it's mental health physical it's all health nobody else can go and get a six pack for you at the gym nobody else can move your bad knee for you only you can do that and it's the same with your mental health but we seem to have forgotten that it's it is firstly our responsibility and I'm not saying that it's always easy my goodness I know it isn't but looking after your physical health isn't always easy is it so I think that we just have to take back that 
that responsibility and that ownership. And I tell you what, it's really bloody empowering, actually, to be able to do that. So I think that's the first thing is, is just knowing about yourself means you can help yourself. And then the second thing is, then you can ask the wider world for help as well. If you need to have certain things in place to work better, if you need to have certain conversations in your relationships, then you have an understanding to be able to do that. Now, I do not have all the answers. I do not articulate my well myself well all of the time. Just ask my partner. Um, but it all comes with learning. And now we can learn a bit together. But it had to start with myself first. Is that, yeah, that's yeah, sort of what it's helped me. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I've always just think the more we know about ourselves, the better. Just down to the basics of do I learn better by reading or listening? You know, just knowing yeah. the basic things about ourselves. So I couldn't agree more. That's, I was wondering your take on it, but I totally agree with you that... The more we understand about ourselves and our families, the better we can put things in place just to make everyone's lives easier. I think that's what my kind of whole philosophy is all about. Like, how can we make life easier? And if that is making sure we're taking care of our health and things so things don't go wrong. Yeah, and I have to say as well, sorry, I was just going to say, like, for the kids, you know, I think back and think, how would things have been different if I was maybe diagnosed earlier? I don't I don't think about that too much because I can't I can't dwell on the past and I, I can't change it but obviously thinking about the way things are now um for children you know we think about their self-awareness well obviously it will help with their self-awareness as they're growing up and we also need to make sure that things are in place in schools and things like that and for when they get to work because there are some things that we might need help with now as I said some of us present differently but if you think about you know children in school especially if they have if they are more on the hyperactive side might be classed as you know a bad child but actually they're just misunderstood yeah and I think a lot of the time even as an adult you know I I bet you've probably people probably might not have noticed I at the end of when I'm explaining something quite often they say does that make sense and that's not because I am questioning my knowledge or what I'm saying it's actually because growing up in life we can so easily be misunderstood that it becomes a habit to make sure that people are understanding what I'm saying because I know that it can maybe come across the same the, the wrong way um and I so often, I think I do that <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, I'm like, yeah. I'm like, blah, blah, blah. does that make sense <laughs> as in I don't know if anything that I said was coherent but I sort of know what I mean <laughs> did it come out okay <laughs> You, my brain's working so quickly like, and did, did that all come out of my mouth how it sounded in my head um but yeah so I think it's important as well for for kids to get the support that they need and I know that it's difficult in schools there's so many children in classrooms and stuff like that but you, you can look now at some of um the adults that are being diagnosed and look back at their school reports and and see how obvious it looked like you know when you're a child, you sometimes struggle with that self-awareness anyway. And then to be told that you're being naughty when you can't understand, I'm not being naughty. You, you know, you mm, you are do being. not think that you're being naughty. You're just yeah, you're just being. So there's still, I think there's still a lot of um a lot of learning to do, but I think that the tides are turning. I, I really do hope you're right. I mean, my absolute hope, I've, I've said this for a long time, is that by the time my children are older, that looking after your mental health is as normal, in inverted commas. As looking after your physical health and that yeah. it's there's no stigma to it um and I, I have high hopes for it because the children are coming home saying we had an assembly on mindfulness and things which never would have happened when I was in school that no. mindful what and no. I didn't know anyone I think the only people who had been diagnosed with anything would have been dyslexia you know there was a bit of that but I don't think there was as much awareness so how where do you see the you know, us as a nation in ten years? Do you think that we're going in the right direction with all of this? Have we got hope for our children? Or are they going to be all right? <laughs> do you know what? I, I usually get a bit ranty about the government if I'm if I'm uh, <laughs> left for too, for too long. But, so, but I won't. What I will say is that I think there are a lot of amazing people that are moving into the right places to be able to make change, and we all have to have hope in that um but we all like i keep saying it's a joint responsibility so we still need to be taking our own personal responsibility and looking after our own little world in and that makes part of the bigger world um and you know when you think about things like obviously i work with organizations um I, I talk about mental health, I talk about mindfulness. And in my in my previous role in the fire service, I was a strategic lead for mental health and wellbeing. And, and when I started to sort of look into our mental health and wellbeing strategy and, and pulling that together, it sort of, I guess, solidified the thoughts and feelings that I was having 
about the disparity between physical because even though we all roll our eyes at health and safety the fact is health and safety health and safety exists to try to put things in place for you to not be injured or to be in crisis in terms of your physical health but we don't have the same outlook when it comes to mental health and i think the other issue is that we talk about mental health as if it's mental ill health mental health does not mean a diagnosis mental health does not mean depression and anxiety mental health is just the term that we're referring to in terms of your health of your mind it is not a diagnosis it is not ill health and i think that that conversation still needs to change because people say even people that i've heard working in the space sometimes say period of mental health there is no period of mental health we all have mental health all of the time and so i think they're the little changes that we need to do and when i talk in organizations and stuff i talk about being a mental health in betweener because that's what i think that the majority of us are. And being a ment mental health in between it means that sometimes your mental health is going to be good. And by the way, good does not always mean positive. It just means that you have things in place to be able to manage. Uh, and sometimes our mental health might take a dip on that roller coaster. And actually we could be in a really, really difficult place, but we're still not at the level of having a diagnosis or maybe we're not at the level of crisis, but we're still in a really, really low place. And I think that that is the journey that most of us have with mental health. And we need to make that more widely understood. Mental health not just about anxiety, mental health, not just about depression, mental health about the continuous journey that we are on that is sometimes awesome and good and sometimes really, really hard. It's strange, isn't it? Because you wouldn't say had a period of health when talking about your physical health. You'd say period of I'm having, no. a, like, having a period of poor health or I'm feeling really healthy at the moment. You wouldn't just say I had, I had health. <laughs> it was just... It's a bizarre, yeah, it's bizarre this, this this massive disconnect. I think that the kind of vibe I'm getting is that we can't we can't rely on and like we can't rely on other people. We've all got we've got to take responsibility for our own lives and our own children. So in doing so, we're gonna take responsibility for for encouraging positive practices in our children. For for example, I do before the children go to bed, I ask them what was the best thing that happened that day, and then they think, Oh well, this was quite good, this was quite good, and they've got to pick the best one and that forces me to do it as well and I feel like by um making it something I'm doing with them I remember to do it because it's for them and sometimes it's hard as mums to do things for ourselves so what can we do with our children and for our children that will also benefit us as mums sure so um first thing I would say is when I wrote the children's journal that I now use in schools which I never thought I would do but it's been it's been awesome and um, that actually came it's a bit different to other other journals because it has an adult's guide that's separate and that exactly plays into what you're saying it because it was all about that collaborative approach um, and making sure that and it's an adult's guide it's not parents it could you know uh, not everybody has parents in their life that are going to do things like this with them um, I've worked in a couple of uh, schools in quite deprived areas where that just isn't it isn't isn't possible so um carers aunties uncles brothers sisters or whatever it is but it's all about that collaborative approach like you say and having that support um and some of the things the journals go through is obviously explaining what mindfulness is but the beauty about children is that they don't ask they don't really question it they just give it a go um and it's really lovely to see how quickly they take things on board um so usually around like sort of 10 and 11 year olds and you're just seeing them they just they, they just like enjoy something doing something a bit different so um some of the things in the journal you know asking them how they're feeling or asking them what went well today um just so that they start to get into the habit of being able to recognize how they're feeling and articulate how they're feeling and maybe what played into that and then obviously this also helps with your communication and you learning maybe about your children um and then asking them what didn't go so well so that they are able to know that it's okay to recognize the things that didn't feel so good rather than ever pushing it away or down or ignoring it uh, it's okay to feel sad about something um, and then we work on sort of letting that go not floating away on a cloud is what i always say so that they can let that go um you know we can move on we don't need to worry a little if there is something that we need to address we can do it together um and then we practice the mindfulness together so like you said you practice your gratitude together you can just do a simple breathing exercise that's what i do with my four-year-old you know he uh, he's four going on like 14 but uh, you know he's so small and he just took to that really quickly do little breathing techniques with a swirl on our hand in the moment um and when i sit with him and we do some a little breathing meditation together and quite often i say to him what is mindfulness and he'll he'll tell me so i'm really with you on that sort of collaborative approach trying to get to do it together um and remember 
remember, it doesn't all have to be calm. One of our mindful practices is Lego. Um, and that really helped me because with I think it might be a bit of an ADHD trait that I don't really, I'm not very good sometimes with imaginative play, like keep playing with the same car, brum, brum, up and down the, you know, <laughs> the, the, the mat. Um, but Lego is totally different, I guess you know that's a little bit of a hyper fixation for me i really enjoy it it's a really good mindful task um and so we do that together uh sometimes we free play so we do lego bingo where we just get a handful of lego and see what we can build sometimes we'll have a set and uh that i think is the beauty of mindfulness that you can make it whatever you want it to be um so try and think outside the box try and think about things you want to do together if you are someone that likes to have a walk get your kid involved and go out and start to notice the things maybe put your phones away and actually start to talk about what you can see what what you can hear what you can smell and and yeah just little things like that i think sometimes we make we make this into a big thing in our mind but it's just the small habits every day probably lots of us are doing mindfulness in small ways that we don't even know so for example sometimes yeah. i ask the children quite often actually what was their peak and pit of the day and that's you know the high point and their low point which is literally what you've just described but i think perhaps we don't give ourselves enough credit because hey that's mindfulness like, yeah. oh, and so... I think people don't like to use the word for some reason. I was told when I started moving into some corporate stuff, oh, well, you could call it something else. You could call it managing stress or you could call it working on resilience or blah, blah, blah. And I said, I don't want to. I said, it, I want to call it mindfulness because I want people to be more comfortable with saying that. It's not, yeah. it, it, you know, I don't want to shy away from it. Um, so, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. And more people are doing it than they think. And when I start to explain it, people go, oh yeah, I, I do that when I'm doing X, Y, and Z, or I notice that when I'm doing this, that, and the other. Um, paddle boarding for me, again, is a mindfulness <laughs> exercise because mm. you've got to focus on staying upright, not fall in the water, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, everybody will have their thing. You've just got to find what works for you. It's just good to know that perhaps it, we don't have to start from scratch on this, that perhaps there's already some things that we can just improve and do more of. So that, that's really, really good. I've got to ask, because it's something that I struggle with, meditation and yoga and things. So I, I put this in with mindfulness. I struggle so much to just quiet my mind. I feel like it's almost impossible. <laughs> it can't be. So what do you understand meditation to be and how on earth do you do it? Because it's something I've never really understood. I, how do I make my mind just go quiet? I don't get it. <laughs> okay, I hate to break it to you, but more likely than not, not really going to happen quieter maybe <laughs> okay but uh you know when i see things that say empty your mind well the only time you can have an empty mind probably is when you're dead like even people who are <laughs> like, on the top of a mountain top <laughs> no but you know what i'm saying i think it's just an absolutely out of reach thing for yeah. people what, so it's just what unrealistic it? expectation. Your mind. like what i'm gonna tip my head to the side and it's all gonna fall out of my ear it just it just doesn't that's just so out of reach for people and 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 you're sitting here saying it so you know exactly what i'm saying that yeah. you, you feel it so then what happens that's a barrier because you think i can't do that so i'm not even going to try so to, to me as you can now tell because i'm getting all passionate about it um it just put it just puts people off so i wish people would stop saying it um it was even on a, a, a quite a big campaign that said uh, something around quiet sometimes you can't quiet your mind it's not about that right meditation you you might you will have relaxing moments in meditation but ultimately that is not the sole aim of meditation meditation is all about recognizing that you are thinking when you are thinking as you start to do that naturally your thoughts will start to slow because you'll be able to come back to an anchor whether that is someone speaking on a meditation or whether it's coming back to your breath and as you start to do that, your thoughts will start to slow. And then when you drift off again with your thoughts, you go, oh, I've just had a thought. I'm going here tomorrow, whatever it is. You come back again to the meditation. Boom. You've just practiced mindfulness. You've just done a rep, if you like. You've just exercised your brain. So you go off, you come back. You go off, you come back. And ultimately what this does is it starts to help you defuse from your thoughts it helps you to realize that you are not your thoughts because that's the biggest issue if you think of, especially if, if you think about things like anxiety and depression people are very fused with the thoughts that they have they believe they are the reality and they run away with them so it really helps us to defuse from our thoughts separate from our thoughts and the other thing it helps us to do is just to recognize that we're having a thought and let it go so that you will start to find that they will slow down there's lots of different visualizations you can do for this you can do body scans 
guided meditations but ultimately the aim here is not to sit there and think that you are going to experience some sort of euphoric calm state now i'm not saying that in the long term that might never happen i was even speaking to a friend recently who'd been on a silent retreat and she said there were some really calm moments but empty mind she wouldn't have explained it as that so so for me it's more about recognizing your thoughts separating from your thoughts and being able to just sit and allow your thoughts to come and go rather than to keep running away with them and the more that you do that in meditation the easier it becomes to do that just in your everyday life when like it hits the fan and you need to you know do something differently shift your awareness move your attention it's easier for you to do it and the science backs this up by the way i always like to be a little bit of science you know when they look at brain scans about after meditation and you can see the new connections in your brain you can see that the prefrontal cortex is activated during meditation and that is what you need that rational part of your brain to be able to kick in especially when you are in fight flight or freeze mode so that is what is not about emptying your mind (laughs) oh well fantastic because i think i think that just seems so unachievable to be like silence silence like, like who can do that so it's actually more about calming and slow wing than achieving a state Yes, exactly. And I'm not saying I've had I've probably say out of all these years that I've been practicing mindfulness and meditating, I've had probably two profound moments where I really felt a stillness, but it didn't last that long. And, you know, it's it's not something that is a regular occurrence. For me, it's just all about being able to slow down. Now, I understand why people probably want to empty their mind because it's it feels relentless, but you can still come into a state of relaxation. You can still calm yourself down elongating your out breath when you're conscious breathing activates your parasympathetic nervous system that helps you to calm like physiologically you can do that but i just think emptying your mind and quieting your mind are terms that need to be like chucked in the bin um, and people need to understand that that is not what it's all about um so yeah don't so start if, with 20 minutes silent meditation <laughs> <laughs> so if um, i like i listen to meditation things mostly in order to fall asleep because i find mm. that helps but if perhaps then I could focus on not silencing my mind, but just actually listening to it rather than wandering, then that would be huge progress. And I think, yeah. So a couple, a couple of tips for you and for anyone else is if you want to use the meditation to fall asleep, great, because sleep is really important. Sleep is like the number one thing we all need for good mental health. So absolutely do that. Um, and a lot of the time, even I teach at my local college, so 17, 18 year olds, I get them to do a meditation. Honestly, they'd like start nodding. And I'm like, I'm like, you girls, you really need to get some more sleep. Um, but that's what happens often because we don't slow down enough. We don't slow down enough. And there is research as well to show that actually meditation can give us a deeper rest than sleep so meditation is really important even though you feel like your mind hasn't been empty you are still absolutely resting and calming your nervous system um and if you want to use it to go to sleep absolutely fine but what i would say is if you would like to experience meditation and not fall asleep actually sit up don't do it in bed maybe choose before you go to bed to sit up and you know things like just not having your back on the seat because you might still start to doze off just little adjustments like that if you would like to listen to a meditation um and don't make them too long either Either, because otherwise again you might drift off to sleep start with something a bit shorter um, so you start to get a feel for it and you start to experience it because the, the more you do it the easier it becomes and also the more that you do it the more that you want to do it because you actually have experienced something that is it's quite nice sometimes can I just also just do a really quick side note that sometimes um, a meditation doesn't feel enjoyable or relaxing because if you think about if you're in a certain time in your life where things are feeling tough, if you sit in meditation and you start to bring your attention to the present moment and you are sitting with yourself, you might notice thoughts that are unhelpful. You might notice thoughts that uh, make you feel sad or anxious. And the important thing is, is to remember this, that in that moment you are safe and all is well and it is okay to recognize those thoughts it's okay to have feelings that don't feel so good and you might even come out of a meditation feeling more agitated which we you know everybody's going to think well that that can't be right that's not the 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 aim of meditation but actually what you are doing is you're being aware of your current situation your current reality you can then take steps to hopefully more rationally choose to do things that will help you if you have had that experience so it doesn't happen often but i just have to give that side note um because you know i've worked with people i volunteer at my local mental health charity and they're people that are not 
well um, and you can still practice mindfulness but sometimes it might be a little bit uncomfortable um, but something that we say in mindfulness is that often we can explore the uncomfortable with gentleness and kindness um, and knowing that we're safe oh, well that, that's I think that's important to realize and perhaps that just because you've had one less than positive experience with it it doesn't mean how yeah that will always be so as mums, what would you say are uh, like three key like takeaways? If you could just say three things to mums or to your younger self when you're about to become a mum about mindfulness and mental health, like, what would you mm-hmm. say to, to mums listening and, and to yourself? Because I think a lot of the things I say, I'm speaking to my younger self. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the first thing and the biggest thing is that you – are not the only one going through what you are going through often it feels it can feel quite lonely and when you look to the outside world especially i think um maybe for for our generation and particularly for uh, the older generation that everybody's got everything together everybody else is doing all right uh, you know why am i struggling with x y and z thankfully i think more people are speaking out now but i i had even like really good friends best friends that I didn't know some of the stuff that they went through and if I'd known some of that I might not have felt so alone when I started to struggle as a new mum so I think the first thing is that you absolutely are not the only one going through this (laughs) and social media doesn't help that because although there are more people speaking out with a more balanced view uh, and this is why I come on whenever I am having a bit of a difficult day even if it's not something I can talk about because it's not directly about me so I can't talk about it because it's someone else's thing and it's it's not appropriate I do feel it's important to say not everyone's lives are as shiny as they put on Facebook <laughs> but it's so easy no. to think and every time I say that the number of messages I get going oh wow I really needed to hear this so whoever needs to hear this right now not everyone's lives are shiny people on Facebook okay <laughs> and and I and I remember vividly being really triggered by seeing um someone who had their baby a couple of months after me um being in the hairdressers having their hair done uh like I, I don't know a week or two after they'd had their baby now I couldn't even hardly function I was crying over the sink a week or two after I'd had had my my baby um and that really triggered me and it took a lot of work I guess but I already had that really good self-awareness to know that that wasn't a them thing like it wasn't a how how can you be doing it, it that was a me thing and not that there was anything wrong with me feeling like that but just understanding sort of why that was a trigger and that it was okay that I was triggered and that I felt upset about it um and I think that that has been a, a really wonderful process to go through to actually realize that um you know it's not about anybody else it's it's about me um and it was okay to feel that way because I did struggle um and I think often you know when we hurt people hurt people I was able to manage that but you have to remember that sometimes you know people are triggered by things and they're going to be you know venting in a way that isn't necessarily helpful and I think my over overarching message is just that we all need to just be a bit kinder to each other um and you know I think especially as mums we're all going through our own struggles we're gonna all gonna have different things um because it is not easy (laughs) no Um, it's not is it yeah so I yeah I think that's that's one of the things you're not alone we're we're all going through something so just just be kind to each other and, and look out for each other um I think the second thing is asking for help and um um, I know that that can be really difficult because, you know, well, this is supposed to be the most natural thing in the world. And, you know, why aren't I managing? But I think that that was really huge for me, to be honest, was asking for help. And remember that it doesn't just have to be help from your immediate friends or family if you're going to return to work for example after maternity leave you are entitled to ask for help you're entitled to talk about how you're feeling you know organizations are there to support you too um you are able to talk to your healthcare provider i think sometimes we feel like we shouldn't be a pain for people but actually we sometimes need help and there is no shame in asking for help uh my mum helped me loads and I don't know what I would have done so I think um sometimes there's lots of different reasons why we don't ask for help and I know it isn't always easy um but yeah really make sure you ask for help and I think the third thing on that vein is to offer help to others um I understand you know if you're going through your thing but I think that we also need to do it the other way around it's not always for somebody to recognize that they need help we need to be able to recognize in others as well so um yeah I guess it all just comes back to kindness really and just knowing that we all have 
um, this journey with our mental health um, and, and being a mum can be really difficult. So, so yeah, just got to look after yourself and, and other people um, and don't be afraid to ask for help and do what you need because I think we often put ourselves last. <laughs> oh, absolutely. We're bottom of the heap. <laughs> We're bottom of the heap. But then I'm, I keep coming back to this more and more to remind myself more than anything about if I don't put on my own oxygen mask first, then everyone else is, I'll pass out and I can't help anyone else. And you can't pour from it. Yeah. Cup and all these cliches. And we are but, an individual as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's so, it's so difficult to remind ourselves of that, but it's absolutely so important for, for the sake of everybody <laughs> that we come into contact with. So thank you so much. This has been an amazing chat. Um, Amy, where can people find you, learn more, do more, you know, with you um let, let us know where we can where people can follow you and find you yeah so uh my instagram is this is amy polly uh linkedin amy polly my website is amypolly.com um i have got a facebook page but i don't, I don't really use it uh, so i am there if people use facebook and want to um have a look or message or what have you um and i think that's about it and yeah. where can they buy these journals uh the journals are on my website right, um I think I've got some in stock at the moment. They're just going through a little bit of a revamp because um, I'm going into more schools now, which is nice. And actually some of the organisations that I'm working with, because I have an adults one, um, but they are they should be out of stock on the website. They're going to have some of the journals too. So we're going to have some adults going away and doing journaling in their organisations, which is cool. Oh, fantastic. Oh, well, it's been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that chat. I would like to apologize for the slight audio issue. I had my big fancy microphone all plugged in. It's the first time I've done one of these interviews using that software. And you know what? I didn't click the right button. It was all working. And then when I brought an interview guest on, I was supposed to click another button to use the right microphone. It didn't happen. So the audio from my end was less than perfect. And I would just like to apologize for that. So thank you so much for listening to it and hopefully ignoring that. Don't forget to like and subscribe and do all those super YouTube things. There are more videos to choose from on screen now. I shall see you over there in one of those. Bye.